as Steph mentioned, my name is Joseph Gentili, and I'm the librarian here at Archbold. Part of my responsibilities are to oversee a couple of special collections archives, and I'm going to talk about one of them today, the Richard Archbold Archive. Uh, our founder, Richard Archbold, donated a variety of materials to the station, including uh, correspondences from when he was a young man, and today we're going to talk about those. Whenever I discuss this archive or any archive, I always just like to briefly touch upon why archives are important. This comes from the archives at King's College and Cambridge University. Archives are important because they provide evidence of activities and they tell stories, but they're really important because they weren't usually created for the purpose of historical research. So they often provide less bias accounts than you would get from secondary sources, i.e. stories told after the fact. So as we've been working on the Richard Archbold Archive Project for the last year, there are two main questions we've been thinking about. Can we better understand why Richard Archbold established a base camp in Arizona and later Archbold Biological Station in Highlands County, Florida? And can we learn more about what led to Richard Archbold's interest in biology and in mammalogy in particular as he was growing into adulthood? Both of these are stories that we have evidence of, but anything we can supplement in his own words, especially at the time period in question, would greatly add to the knowledge about him. Here you see a photo of Richard Archbold in the uh, time period in question. This is actually a digital image of a photograph that's nearly 100 years old. And part of the efforts of the archive project are to preserve these artifacts. During phase one, we're trying to preserve and protect his correspondences in particular. And there are three main types of items contained within these correspondences. The first, as you might imagine, are letters. On the left, you can see a letter from his aunt um, from March 15th, 1929, so it's 91 years old. And you can see there's some signs of distress and staining and some other um, defects on the edges. But for a 91-year-old document, this is in pretty good shape. On the right, you see the second type of document. There are awards and certificates of Mr. Archibald's. Um, he received many awards, certificates, membership citations, et cetera, throughout his life. But the ones he chose to keep tell us a little bit about him as well. So this is from the New York Academy of Sciences, and it says that he's been elected an active member um, from 1940. So this is 80 years old. And again, you can see it's in pretty good shape with just a little bit of signs of wear. The last document type in these correspondences are actually telegrams. Um, these are surprisingly informative documents for their size. Telegrams come with specific timestamps. So on the top left, you can see it was sent out on April 8th, 1931. And you can even see it was at 10, 10 p.m. Um, it has the place where it was sent from and where it was sent to. And that one in particular for an 89-year-old telegram, the colors are pretty sharp up top. But you can see the whiter parts have aged and there's also tearing and some fold issues on both. So our main goal in this project is to preserve and protect these materials so that another 100 years from now or more, they will still look the way that they do now. But throughout the course of protecting these materials, we also want to analyze them to some degree. So each letter and correspondence is read through once and then cataloged. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of what we've learned while going through those correspondences. Can we see in these correspondences any interest instances or examples of what drew Richard Archibald to nature, exploring biology, et cetera, when he was a younger man. This photo is just a little bit later um, when he was about 35 years old, but we're mostly gonna discuss him as a teenager into his middle twenties. So the first letter I would like to show you is from August 8th, 1924. So 96 years old. Um, Richard Archibald was a 17 year old at this point and this is one of the first letters that exists in the collection at all. It describes a camping trip that he took with a friend of his to an island named Robbins Island. And you can see he says, started on a night's camping trip to Robbins Island, which by the way is one of the most mosquito and gnat infested islands that I have ever seen. So if, as you read through the letter, it turns out that the mosquitoes and the gnats were bad enough that it actually woke both of them up two different times. And they had to uh, really suffer through pretty unbearable uh, mosquito attacks, but it didn't deter them. And at the very end, it says they made it to the morning, had breakfast, and then returned. 
Two years later, we have a letter of his to his mother um, from Arizona. And for this document and the next one, there's two important pieces of context. In 1926, Arizona and New Mexico were not the areas we think of now as these populous southwestern states. They were actually both the last two states to be admitted to the Union of the Lower 48, and it was only in 1912. So as he's exploring these areas, they're not really like what we think of now in terms of their population densities, but also the road situation in these areas was much more primitive than it is now. This is before the interstate highway system. So even traveling from city to city in 1920s cars on 1920s roads was a bit of an adventure in and of itself. So writing from Arizona to his mother, he describes a trip with several friends where they went riding through a perfect deluge of rain. <clears throat> also, they started up a neighboring canyon and climbed some of the steepest hills in the country. But just a couple sentences later, he talks about how wonderful a time he had despite these hardships. Later on Saturday, they walked to the top of some neighboring mountains. So you can already see that adventuring and mountaineering in particular are activities that appealed to him as a 19 year old. In 1927, he wrote a letter to his father from Colorado, but it actually describes a variety of places within the southwestern United States. He and some compatriots took a ride on horseback through the prehistoric ruins, which in a poor state of preservation were still unmolested by anyone. And later, they took a three day trip to a bridge, which took about six hours by mule to reach. Then they went to Mesa Verde National Park where we saw more prehistoric ruins overshadowing any I had ever seen before. And lastly, he describes a side trip to a canyon hemmed in on all sides by high snow covered peaks, though it's May. <clears throat> and from there, they're going to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico, Zion National Park in Utah, and Yosemite National Park in California. So this letter is dated May 16th from Colorado. And it mentions at the end that they won't get to the Yosemite until at least June 11th, which is in California. So for a month plus, he and compatriots are exploring through the Southwest. But again, as I mentioned, it's not just the trips to the parks, the hikes, the mule rides that are part of the adventure. Simply getting to these places at this time period would have been somewhat complicated and an adventure in and of itself. So this is already displaying a desire to get off the beaten path. And even when seeing sort of tourist type attractions, i.e. national parks, a more immersive experience than probably your average person would take in these locales. So by 1929, just two short years later, Rich Archbold is 22 years old and he is going to engage on his first official scientific expedition. He went along with the American Museum of Natural History and a French uh, scientific Exploratory Agency to Madagascar to study the flora and fauna of Madagascar. And en route, he received a letter from his mother. And in it, it describes a somewhat humorous anecdote where Richard's sister, Frances, had actually mailed their parents a live armadillo, because in the 1920s, you could send live animals through the mail. So his mother described to Richard about how the armadillo was fairly uninteresting. And instead of just taking that at face value, he says that he opened his book on mammals, which he had brought all the way from New York City to Madagascar for research while being working on mammals. He says, I see in my book on mammals, they are entirely nocturnal and burrowing and they are omnivorous. So instead of just assuming that this animal that maybe he didn't know so much about was boring, he went and looked it up and explained to his mother that, you know, maybe you're looking at it at the wrong time of day and that's why it doesn't seem to be doing much. Also, for the first time, we see more rigorous tracking of dates, times, and sightings in this letter. He mentions that on April 5th, we saw several schools of flying fish and a migration of 18 harrier hawks. And later on, he timestamps 1800 um, when he viewed some rocky inlets. So although he's just beginning on his professional career as an explorer and biologist, you're already starting to see more of the uh, rigors that we would associate with later scientific explorations. Much later in 1929, during a break in the expedition, Richard Archibald actually went to Victoria Falls, um, which is currently where Zimbabwe and Zambia meet. And it's one of the real natural wonders of the world, a place that tourists have been visiting for a very long time. And he wrote his mother a letter to describe this trip, 
But before we hear anything about Victoria Falls or about the country in general, the very first thing he discusses are ground squirrels. I saw several animals I think were ground squirrels, though their bodies did not seem quite like that. So already you can tell sort of in action what his thinking about. This is a letter to his mother who he only communicates with maybe once a month on average if we have all the letters between them from this time period. And the very first thing he chooses to mention are ground squirrels and then later the falls, which presumably would have been the item his mother was most interested in. So can we draw any conclusions from all of these correspondences, not just the five that we've displayed today? Yes, there are three main conclusions that we can draw. Richard Archbold had an interest in nature even as a teenager. It's very apparent. He wrote more and more effusively when he's discussing nature than on any other subject. To provide some minimal context, um, baseball was second, but it's not really close. It's clear that even as a young man, nature is something that he wants to engage in. But it also seems that he's engaging in it with others. These aren't solitary experiences. He's going with one, two, sometimes three or four other people to explore. Um, and that's important because working together on an expedition like he would do in the 1930s on three expeditions to New Guinea requires the ability to get along with people for long stretches of time in somewhat difficult conditions. So in some ways, his leisure activities were preparing him for what he would later engage in professionally. Along those same lines, adventuring, camping, mountaineering, exploring, those types of activities that we will associate with his professional career trajectory, they're clearly enjoyable pastimes before that. When he does write about the activities he's engaged in, frequently they're very brief descriptions, a sentence or two. But when he describes camping, climbing mountains, taking mule rides, there's much more uh, descriptive language used. And he obviously is trying to paint a more complete picture for the recipient of these letters than when he's discussing other items, what he's done socially, um, even other interests. And a really key contribution from these is that even at a young age, hardships, including travel conditions, insects, and weather, don't really seem to be deterrents to these activities. For the vast majority of the 1930s, Richard Archibald is engaging in or preparing expeditions to New Guinea. For years of that time, he's spending a lot of effort preparing, but also time in these locales. And getting to these places, the insects you're going to have to deal with, the weather there are all major impediments to a successful scientific expedition. But we can see that he's been preparing for these for several years before he engages in them in his personal life. And it does seem that they weren't major deterrents to him when he had a goal he wanted to accomplish. I just want to thank um, Archbold Expeditions board member Jack Hufty and the Hufty Foundation. Without their generous support, none of this research would really be possible. Um, I also would like to thank Archbold Biological Station Librarian Emeritus Fred Lohr. Any of you who have an affiliation with Archbold probably have interacted with Fred, and he has spent the better part of the last five decades trying to preserve these materials and also inform others on Richard Archbold's legacy. And of course, lastly, I'd like to thank Richard Archbold himself. Without his methodical saving of these records, we would never would be able to tell this picture. He took the time and effort to save letters from countries all around the world, compile them in a coherent manner and preserve them so that when they ended up in this archive, we can preserve them for the long haul. But the reason they exist at all nearly 100 years later in some cases is because he had the foresight to save them. I'll open the floor now for any questions and thank you all for attending.